Now we have the skills to have an equation for any shape that we like and to convert that into a PDF fairly easily. Just figure out what the area underneath that curve is right now and take your equation and multiply by the reciprocal of that area. But in a lot of cases in business analytics and in science, there are notorious distributions that almost seem tailor-made and natural to model the quantities that we would wish to study. So what are these notorious continuous distributions and when can we use them? So first, a little bit about notation. Now, no one's going to expect you to remember all of the ins and outs and the details about all of these distributions in the Notorious Zoo. You're going to have to go look up those properties on Wikipedia or some other resource. And so I wanted to make sure that you're aware of some rather infuriating notation choices that people have decided to make over the years. So if you head on over to the log normal distribution, the Poisson distribution, the normal distribution, you'll find a wealth of information about where these distributions are applicable, formulas for their PDFs, the expected value, the variance for the standard deviation, etc. But the notation isn't always consistent. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, universally in probability and statistics, mu is our symbol for the expected value of a random variable and sigma is our universal symbol for the standard deviation of a random variable. But wouldn't you know it, some people like using mu and sigma in other contexts, and so you have to be very careful when you go and actually read the definition of a PDF, and if you see a mu and a sigma, you have to ask yourself, well, is that actually the mean and standard deviation, or is that just the choice that they've made in order to parameterize that distribution? So, for example, the log normal distribution, if we go and look to see, well, what's the formula for the PDF of a log normal distribution? We see a mu, we see a sigma, but disappointingly, if we go and look at the expression for the average value, or the variance, the square root of the variance of the standard deviation, the expression for the average value is not mu, but it's some complex equation of mu and sigma squared. If I look at the equation of the variance, it's not sigma squared, but it's some complex equation of mu and sigma squared again. So be aware that there are notational frustrations when it comes to dealing with probability distributions. Mu and sigma should always be the mean and standard deviation of probability distributions, but people very often use those letters in other contexts. All right, so what are the distributions we want to be familiar with and how are we going to work with them, more importantly in R? It's going to work very similar to when we were discussing notorious discrete distributions, like the Poisson and the binomial. We're going to identify the distribution with a short abbreviation, like Poiss was for Poisson, Binome was for Binome. We're going to uh, identify the abbreviation for our continuous distribution, and the function that we'll use to play around with it in R is going to be one we obtain just by prefacing it with a D, a P, or a Q, or an R. So preface it with a D and you get the height of the PDF at that point. Typically not something that we're interested in, but it's nice to plot the D function so we can see what that PDF actually looks like. So the D function really only used for making plots. It's the P function that does all that heavy lifting. So the P function is capital F, the cumulative distribution function, and that's how we're actually going to figure out probabilities. You want to know the probability of observing 100 or something smaller, Okay, well, it's the p function evaluated at 100. If it's going to be in a range between 100 and 200, well, we take the p function, plug in the upper range, minus that p function, plugging in that lower range. So when we deal with continuous distribution and we're asking actual probability questions of finding an x inside of a range, we'll always be using that p function. The Q function allows us to find percentiles and quantiles, something we didn't do back in discrete world, but that we've seen the utility of for continuous distributions. So if we have a demand distribution, that's a notorious distribution, we want to know what's that 99th percentile, well, we'll ask for the Q version of that function evaluated at 0.99. And then finally, preface it with an R, and we're going to get random numbers from that distribution. Very useful for Monte Carlo simulations. All right, so the first stop in our notorious zoo is the uniform distribution. And the uniform distribution typically is going to be one of our last resorts. We really only use that uniform distribution when we only know the range of possible values that we might see, but we don't really have any details about the shape of that distribution. 
Sure, there are a few contexts where we would use the uniform distribution kind of just by logic alone. So like if a stoplight was red for 45 seconds, green for 15, and then yellow for four, we could use the uniform distribution to describe the length of time that's left on the light remaining red when we show up to it, assuming that it's red to begin with, because it could be anywhere from zero to 45 in that case. But most of the time, we're gonna have some idea of what the shape or the peaks are of that distribution. Now, on the Shiny app, we can see that the two parameters that we can tweak with this distribution are the lower and the upper bounds. But you know the key features are is that any value inside that range is gonna be equally likely. We just have a flat PDF between the lower and upper values and then zeros throughout the rest. So not one that we typically use in business analytics unless we really have no information about the, the process. There are formulas for little f, capital F, you'd like to use them. We have formulas for the expected value of the uniform distribution, just you know, the max minus min value over two, and a formula for the standard deviation. You can look at those up on Wikipedia as well. But it's the first and really the simplest distribution when it comes to the continuous notorious zoo. Now, I think the most famous distribution of all time is a continuous distribution, and that's the normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, the bell-shaped curve. It goes by many different names. So the main features of this distribution is that the distribution is symmetric. So it peaks right up in the center, falls off at equal rates on either sides. It allows any possible value of x you want to throw at it. So it's defined for both positive and negative values as well. And we parameterize the curve by where it peaks. That's going to be the mu parameter, the expected value. And then also the standard deviation of that curve, the sigma parameter. Now, let's take a really close look at what the shape of this normal curve looks like, because sigma can actually anticipate where it is based on the shape of that curve. So if you look really closely, if you go away from the peak, let's say to the right, what you find is that the curve slopes downward kind of faster and faster and faster, but only out to a point. At that point where the curve changes from sloping downward to sloping outward, its inflection point is related to that standard deviation. The standard deviation is the distance between where the peak of the distribution is to when that transition occurs, where that inflection point is. So if you look at a normal curve, you can immediately identify the mu parameter as where it peaks. If you look to see where does it transition from sloping downwards to sloping outwards, that inflection point, you know what that sigma is. Varying mu and sigma is going to allow you to capture a lot of different symmetric bell-type curve shapes. So on the Shiny app, tweaking the mu parameter just shifts the peak left and right, keeps the same width overall. If I start changing the standard deviation parameter, well, smaller standard deviations makes it a lot skinnier. Values are more concentrated close to the average. And if we make the standard deviation larger and larger, the values get more and more spread out. A really large standard deviation spreads out the values over a really big range of x here. So where do we use the normal distribution? Well, we use it when we have positive and negative values that are allowed, and we anticipate the shape of the distribution to be roughly symmetric. Now, even when sometimes negative values are forbidden by the process that we're looking at, if we only have positive values, it's sometimes it's okay to still use that normal distribution if the probability of getting a negative value from that curve is pretty tiny. We know our probability models are wrong, as long as our model is assigning a pretty small, tiny probability to negative values, which would be impossible for our process, then we're pretty much good to go. So where do we end up using this? Well, we use this a lot actually in science. So if you had taken a probability class as uh, um, previously, you might have talked a lot about this normal curve. It's kind of the statistician's go-to. So if we're measuring physical measurements on people, or animals, or plants, etc. Very often those measurements have a normal distribution. So if we think of the distribution of men's heights, women's heights, birth weights, circumferences of abdomen, circumferences of wrists, uh, the length of French bulldog hairs, or maybe the circumference of oranges. I ate this one already, it was tasty. Uh, those sorts of physical measurements tend to be roughly symmetric, and so they're typically reasonably well modeled by a normal curve. 
In business analytics, well, where is the normal distribution being used? Well, if we look at the returns on stocks, the percentage returns, so positive one percentage point, negative 2.5 percentage points, it turns out that a lot of times the distribution of the percentage returns resembles one of these bell-shaped normal curves, roughly symmetric, positive and negative values, we end up using that. Now, if you've done science experiments, science labs, very often the errors that arise in the measurement process are very well described by the normal curve. And if you think back to a previous unit, when we tried to take the integral of a function and there wasn't a closed form solution, we were actually taking the integral of this function right here with sigma equal to zero, mu is equal to one, and we got that ERF function come out, the name of my friend's chinchilla in college. So ERF is actually named after error function, and that is actually related to just the observation that it tends to really uh, describe quite well errors that arise in the measurement process when doing science. And I don't know about you, but I've actually gone through multiple weeks of timing, the amount of time it takes to get to work from my home, and it turns out that if you look at the distribution of times to work, it looks like a, a normal distribution here, nice and symmetric, so we're good to go. Now, just to reiterate, a lot of these quantities we just listed off inherently are positive quantities. So the normal, technically, you have some probability of observing any positive, any negative quantity as well. It's okay to use this distribution as long as the shape of it is roughly symmetric and the probability of getting that negative value is relatively small, super tiny, if you're dealing with that inherently positive quantity. Now, how would we use this in R? Well, it's good practice. We got three functions, the D, the P, the Q, and the R functions. Almost always when we have probability questions, we'll be sticking with the P questions. So let's imagine that the amount of, of soda that's actually in a can isn't always 355 milliliters as advertised, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Let's say overall the distribution is well described by a normal curve with a peak at 355 and a width of about 2. So mean mu of uh, 355 and sigma standard deviation of 2 here. I could ask, what's the probability of getting a can that has less than 353 milliliters? All right, well, P norm is going to be what I go to for this. Norm is the abbreviation that R knows the normal curve by. P tells me the probability of getting a certain value or something smaller. So P norm of 353 tells me the probability of observing a value of 353 or something smaller. Works out to be about 15.8%. All right, well, what's the probability of getting between 353 and 357 milliliters of soda in this can? Well, if I'm asking about the probability of a range of values, what I'll do is take the P function for the upper range and then subtract off the P function at that lower range. So remember, whenever we're talking about the probability of getting a value inside of a certain range, it's capital F at the upper value minus capital F evaluated at that lower value and that P function is that capital F, the CDF cumulative distribution function. So P norm at 357, comma 355, comma two for the mean and standard deviation, minus the same function evaluated at 353, gives me about 68.2%. Now, that number might sound pretty familiar. You might know the empirical rule when it comes to normal distributions. 68% of values are within plus or minus one standard deviation, 95% of values are within plus or minus two standard deviations, 99.7% of values are within plus or minus three standard deviations. Well, this question just happened to be asking what's the probability of finding an amount of soda within one standard deviation of the peak, and we can see it's 68.3%. That's where that 68 comes from. So one last example, what's the probability of getting more than 360 milliliters? Well, in this case, it's easier to use the complement rule. We have a function that tells us the probability of getting a certain value or something smaller, and so since more than 360 is the opposite of that value or smaller, let's do the that value or smaller and do the one minus trick for the complement rule. So what is the probability of getting 360 or something smaller? Looks like it is uh, right at about 0.9937. So one minus that works out to be about 0.006. Now, R does have the functionality to calculate those greater than um, probability questions directly, all you have to do is add in that argument lower tail equals false, and it'll actually do the that value or something bigger. All right, so I'm going to say that the normal distribution, while it's extraordinarily popular in mathematics and science, 
isn't normally where we want to be in business analytics. I would say that the go-to distribution in business analytics is the log normal distribution. Now, the features of the log normal distribution is that it only allows positive quantities, which is typically what we find in business analytics. We're looking at amounts purchased, which always has to be positive. Call times, wait times, these are always positive as, as well. And so the log normal uh, probability distribution, by definition, is only going to allow positive values, so that's a big plus. But it turns out that there's kind of a nice, tidy relationship to connect these two worlds, the log normal distribution and the normal distribution. So the formula for the PDF looks a little bit similar, except for that we see you know, the natural log of x instead of just x when we're taking e and raising it to a power. And so here's the connection. It turns out that if the random variable capital X has a log normal distribution, well, if we take the logarithm of those values and plot them, we recover a normal distribution. And then vice versa, if capital X, our random variable, is a normal distribution, if we exponentiate those values, take E and raise it to those values powers, well, the resulting distribution is going to be a log normal distribution. So let's actually see that in action here. Let's look at the distribution of the donation amounts that people have made to a veteran's charity. So if I fire up the Reg class library and load up the donor data set, I can get a histogram of the values that I find in the donation amount column. And I see what I very often see in business analytics, something with a peak at lower values and a long right-handed tail, a pretty strong right-handed skew towards larger and larger values. We see this everywhere in business analytics. Well, if I instead make a histogram of the logarithms of those donation amounts, I find that it is roughly symmetric. It's peaking right at around one or so. The bars kind of make it a little bit funny, but it's peaking right at about one. And so here would be a prime case where you know, that log normal distribution might be a good one to propose for this. So if the logs of the original values look like a bell curve, a normal distribution. The log normal is the natural go-to. And so this is, most of the time, what we'll be using in business analytics. The log normal distribution is unimodal, it has a single peak, but it always has that rather pronounced right-hand skew, that slow tapering off towards larger and larger values, and that's pretty typical of what we tend to see in business analytics. Most values clustered around a relatively small range, but then always a few outliers towards larger and larger values here. So how do we talk about the shape of the log normal distribution? Well, we have two parameters. And unfortunately, those two parameters are mu and sigma. They aren't the average. They aren't the standard deviation. But they are the average and standard deviation of the corresponding normal if we were to log the values from the log normal distribution. Sounds confusing, so let's actually just look at a few examples on the Shiny app. If I go down to the log normal distribution, the two parameters as we know them in R are mean log and SD log. That's the mu and sigma parameters that you would see on the Wikipedia page, and they actually correspond to the corresponding mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution that you would get if you examined the log of these values instead. But anyway, how does tweaking those change the shape of the distribution? Well, making the mean log smaller we see that the shape actually stays completely the same. So lesson number one, this first parameter of the log normal distribution is essentially just controlling you know, over what range of values are we seeing the distribution. It's the same shape, but the larger the value of the mean log, the larger the values that we see typically. If I just focus in at the uh, where the peak is, very small value for the mean log parameter, the peak's right at about two, larger value, the peak's right at about 10, even larger value, the peaks right at around 80 or so. Larger values of mean log mean a larger peak and spread out over a larger range of values. So changing mean log doesn't change the shape, really. We always have that, uh, um, that same looking curve. It's just spread over a larger range of values. The SD log parameter, well, when I change it, that is really changing the overall shape. It's kind of refining how tightly concentrated those values are around the peak. At very small values of SD log, 
it actually looks roughly symmetric. We have a lot of dispersion of values around the peak as we go and increase this value of SD log. The values get more and more concentrated around the peak and the tail off towards the right gets more and more pronounced. There's a lot more skewness as we go up to larger values of that SD log parameter. So this one in particular, we see that most of the values are between maybe zero and say 50 or so, but there is still a reasonably high probability of getting a value that's above 100, between 200 and 300, and even one that's even larger than that. So in a sense, it offers the possibility of producing kind of extreme outliers in that distribution, what we see in business analytics really quite often. So where has it been used in business analytics? Well, if you're measuring the length of time someone's spending on a website, maybe most times are between zero and 30 seconds, but there are some people that are gonna be there for minutes, maybe even hours. We'd have a pretty strong right-handed skew up towards those larger values, and so the log normal distribution might be perfect for that. And so really in general, any sort of quantity that, te that tends to vary over many orders of magnitude like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, when all those values actually occur, the log normal distribution tends to do a really good job at actually modeling that distribution. The normal distribution is kind of modeling a relatively small range of values tightly kind of clustered around that peak. The log normal allows you to capture much more variation. So time spent on websites, if we look at the amounts of people uh, that people have donated, that they've earned in their job, or that they've spent on anything over the course of their lifetime, you're going to have most customers being, you know, kind of the same. Their values will be clustered around the typical value, but you'll have those crazy outlier customers that give that distribution a pretty strong pronounced right-handed skew. All right, so if we want to use the log normal distribution in R, how do we do this? And this is actually a little bit tricky. So if we have a data set, and we want to use that data, uh, or we want to use the log normal distribution to model that data, how do we figure out those two parameters, the mean log parameter and the SD log parameter, which was controlling really the shape of that distribution? Well, it'd be kind of a pain to just tweak these and just try to find one that fits your data pretty well. So here's the trick. What you're going to do is you'll read in your data and then ask for the average and standard deviation, not of the original values, but instead of the natural logs of those values. So for that donation amount example, if I ask for the average of the natural log of the donation amount, I get about 2.54. And if I ask for the standard deviation of the log donation amounts, I get about 0.64. And so those would be the two arguments that you're gonna use for the D, the P, the Q, and the R functions when you're working with the log normal distribution. So just to show you that in this case it actually fits really quite well, if we read in those donation amounts and we make a histogram of those and then superimpose the log normal curve when we get the average standard deviation from those log values, we find that it's a pretty good fit. And so how can we ask or answer some probability questions with the log normal distribution? All right, so let's use this data and the resulting log normal distribution to answer the question, what's the probability that someone donates less than $10? So R knows the log normal by the abbreviation L norm. And so PL norm is what we'll be using for answering probabilities. What's the probability of less than 10? Well, by definition, that's going to be the PL norm function evaluated at 10. The second and third arguments will be that mean log and SD log parameters, the values we get by taking the average and standard deviation of the logged values in our data. So 2.54, 0.64, we get about a 35.5% chance that someone's going to donate $10 or less. What about greater than 100? Well, greater than 100 is the opposite of 100 or less, so we'll use the complement rule. If we ask for PL norm of 100, that gives us the probability of 100 or less. One minus that will be the probability of greater than that value, so we find that this is very much a long shot. It can happen, but really only about 0.06 percentage of the time. Don't expect that to happen with many donors. And then what about the probability of being inside of a range, let's say between $10 and $20? Well, we'll use two PL norms. PL norm evaluated at the upper endpoint minus the PL norm evaluated at the lower endpoint. Whenever we're asked for the probability of getting a range of values, it's always that capital F function, the CDF, the P function in R, evaluated at the top minus the uh, P function evaluated at the bottom here. 
All right, another notorious distribution that's seen a lot of use, especially in queuing theory, kind of measuring wait times, service times, processing times, etc., is the exponential distribution. And the reason it's so notorious isn't necessarily because it's that reflective of the actual probability distributions that you find in, say, service times or wait times. It's just really easy to work with mathematically. And it actually does appear in science really quite a bit. And so let's talk about this exponential distribution. So the shape of the exponential distribution, kind of true to form, is exponentially decreasing. It only has one parameter, a lambda parameter. And if we tweak this, we see that the shape really doesn't change whatsoever. It just dictates how quickly that curve is decreasing. So small values of lambda, we can see that the curve is taking its time to get smaller and smaller. There are relatively high probabilities of finding big values of x. If I have a big value of lambda, the opposite is true. The curve actually decreases really quite quickly. The only values of x's that we're likely to see are relatively small values. So bigger the lambda, smaller the values of x. Smaller the lambda, the bigger the values of x. So how does R know the exponential distribution? Well, it knows it by the abbreviation EXP. So if we ask for a curve of, say, DEXP, we can visualize that distribution. We've got a pretty simple formula for the PDF, only that one parameter lambda, and we have a pretty simple formula for the CDF, the probability of getting a value of at most little x as well. Only values of x that are bigger than zero are valid values of x to be observed, and so this does not allow the possibility of negative values of x. Now, if you thought to yourself, now wait a second, I've seen that Greek letter before, I've seen that lambda before in our discussion about notorious distributions, then you're right, because it turns out that the exponential distribution has a very close connection with one of our discrete notorious distributions, the Poisson distribution. And so here's the relationship. If we're going to model let's say the number of arrivals, let's say to a bank or to a restaurant, as a Poisson distribution, like five per hour, 10 per hour, et cetera, then it turns out that we can automatically model the waiting times or the inter-arrival times between sequential events with an exponential distribution with the same value of lambda that we were using for the Poisson. So for example, if we were taking as our model for the number of customers that arrive to a bank in a particular hour, as a Poisson with a lambda equal to 10, we automatically know that the distribution of time between sequential customers is gonna be exponential with that same value of lambda. And what's nice is that the equation for the expected value of the exponential distribution is just one over lambda in this case. So if I were to take the uh, reciprocal of lambda here, which is going to be 10, then I know that the average inter-arrival time is one-tenth of an hour. Kind of makes sense. If 10 on average are going to arrive in a particular hour, well, they should be separated by one-tenth of an hour in terms of arrival times. So where do we find the exponential distribution? Well, modeling waiting times, service times, and business analytics, it's a very common model usually not a great model. We'll talk about backups in a second. But this does actually appear in science really quite a bit. You know, I have a background in astronomy. One of my favorite things to do was to go stargazing, especially during times of the year where there were meteor showers. And it turns out that the time between sequential meteors in the sky is very well modeled by an exponential distribution. If we were to go and study, let's say, a radioactive chunk of material and measure the amount of time between uh, different bursts of radioactiveness, so some you know, high charged particles or light rays kind of getting out of that, uh, that chunk, you would find that the inter-arrival time is very well modeled by an exponential distribution. And things that just kind of naturally arise in nature, like distances between cracks, or if you were to go and say, dig up a little bit of your yard, the distance between earthworms in your yard, probably gonna be well modeled by an exponential distribution as well. But here's one drawback to actually modeling something with an exponential distribution, at least in business analytics, and this kind of invalidates most of the places that it's used in business analytics, is that the exponential distribution is the only continuous distribution that is memoryless. Now, we saw this with the geometric distribution in the discrete world, where if we're counting up the number of failures 
until our very first success, we saw that the number of additional trials we have to wait for that first success to occur, the number of failures we still have to wait through to get that first success, that was independent uh, from the number of failures we've experienced so far. So it didn't matter if we were just starting out or if we had just had 100 failures all in a row, you know, the expected number of failures until that very first success was going to be the same regardless. It's going to be the same sort of situation here for the exponential distribution. So let's give that a little bit of a context and talk about the consequences. Let's talk about the random variable x. So that's going to be the name of our random variable. It's going to be the waiting time between sequential visitors to a store. So here's the scenario. A customer has just arrived. I might be interested in asking the question, what's the probability that it takes longer than 10 minutes for the next person to arrive? In other words, what's the probability that capital X is larger than 10? So I could come up with an answer for that. I'll do that in a second. And then I might have a follow-up question. I might have noticed that, you know, it's actually been an hour since that last customer arrived. I could ask the question, okay, well, given that it's been an hour since the last customer arrived, now what's the probability that it takes longer than 10 minutes for the next one to arrive? You know, if we waited an hour, we kind of feel like the next customer has to be due. They should arrive at any sort of minute. So we would expect these two probabilities to be really quite different. If the customer just arrived, What's the probability that the next one will be you know, longer than um, 10 minutes away? This would be a very different number than if we had already waited an hour. Kind of our instinct says that those should be two different numbers. But because the exponential process is memoryless, it turns out that those two probabilities are actually going to be the same. So regardless of how much waiting time we've already put in, the probability we'll have to wait an additional 10 minutes is going to be the same regardless if we waited no time at all so far, regardless if we waited two hours, 10 hours, etc. So let's see how the math bears this out. And we'll go back and use our classic rule for conditional probability. What's the probability of A given B? Well, that's the probability that both events occur, probability of A and B, divided by the probability of the event on which we're conditioning on. So we'll use this, and we'll also use a key result with the exponential distribution that gives us a very simple formula for the probability of observing a value that's greater than little x. So greater than little x is the opposite of less than or equal to little x. So we can write the probability of observing a value that's greater than little x as 1 minus the probability of observing a value of, uh, of x here, less than or equal to little x. Now, we have the formula for what capital F is, that probability of observing a value at most little x. And so if we do 1 minus capital F, we find we get some cancellation. And that probability of observing a value greater than little x is just e to the minus lambda x. Just a little bit of math. So if I wanted to know what's the probability of waiting you know, at least 10 minutes for that next customer to arrive, say the first customer just arrived right now, that would be just plugging 10 into that equation e to the minus 10 lambda. All right, so let's tackle this problem. What is the probability I have to wait at least 10 more minutes for that next customer to arrive, given that I've already waited t minutes? So probability of A given B is the probability that they both occur, divided by the probability of the event on which we're conditioning. So the numerator is going to be the probability of waiting at least 10 more minutes, and we've waited at least 10 minutes so far. So in other words, what's the probability of waiting, you know, at least t plus 10 minutes? So we waited 10 minutes so far, or t minutes so far, waiting at least an additional 10. What's the probability of at least 10 plus 10, t plus 10 minutes until that next customer arrives? And then we have the formula for probability of waiting at least t minutes. That's e to the minus lambda t. So taking our expression for what's the probability of waiting at least x minutes, little x minutes, that was just e to the minus lambda x, putting in t plus 10 in for x here, we get that the probability that we have to wait at least 10 more minutes, you know, and we've already waited t minutes, works out to be e to the minus lambda times t plus 10. Now, studying that equation, here's the crazy thing. What we find is that the e to the minus lambda t cancels out in the numerator and in the denominator, leaving us with just e to the minus 10 lambda which is that probability of waiting at least 10 minutes for the next customer to arrive. So what our derivation has shown is that it doesn't matter how long I've already waited with no customer arriving, 
the probability that it takes at least 10 more minutes for the next customer to arrive is always going to be the same. So for all intents and purposes, it's like this process resets itself from a probabilistic point of view. And that's the only continuous distribution where we have this memoryless property. And so now we can see why it's not really the most realistic model for a lot of things that we would be tempted to use it for in business analytics, like waiting times or service times. You know, if I'm going to have as my random variable the length of time I have to wait for the next bus to arrive, well, if I've already waited 15 minutes for it to, to get here and it's still not here, then yeah, it kind of is due pretty soon because they're you know on a set schedule. The memoryless property, the exponential would say, okay, so what? You've waited 15 minutes so far. The probability you have to wait an additional five minutes, it's the same. If you just showed up, waited 10 minutes, waited an hour, and that's not how the real world works. So very often, the exponential distribution doesn't really quite cut it as a great model for business analytics. But as we've seen with some of the math, the math works out so nice that people tend to use it anyway, especially if they're doing theoretical work in queuing theory manufacturing processes, etc. It just speeds up the math. It gives us a decent guess for the answers, but we can definitely do better when it comes to a probabilistic model. So how can we know when the exponential distribution might be appropriate? Well, if the process is memoryless, ask that question first. We know the exponential distribution only allows positive values. It has that strong right-handed skew. It just decays exponentially as we go to larger and larger values. And it turns out that the mean and the standard deviation for this distribution are actually just the same, the inverse of that lambda parameter here. So not always a realistic model for things we'd like to use in business analytics, but one you'd like to consider because you just never really know. Now, what is you know, a more useful distribution for service times, waiting times, et cetera, in business analytics? Well, the Weibull distribution is actually going to be one of those go-tos in business analytics for those sorts of quantities. So why do we like the Weibull distribution? Well, number one, only positive values are allowed. Number two, it actually gives you a really good variety of shapes. You can have a left-handed skew. You can have a right-handed skew. You can have it be roughly symmetric. In fact, of all the notorious distributions in this unit that have just general values that are positive, the Weibull is the only one that gives you the possibility of a left-handed skew. Now, it turns out that the Weibull is related to the exponential distribution. If you had your random variable x, which was exponentially distributed, and you raised it up to a power, like you squared it, you cubed it, you took the square root of it, it turns out that that distribution turns out to be a Weibull distribution. So there is a connection between the exponential and the Weibull. In fact, if you put in just the right parameters into the Weibull distribution, you get the exact same formula as an exponential distribution out. So the Weibull really is just that generalization of the exponential. It is the exponential and even more here. So R refers to the Weibull with the abbreviation Weibull. So I guess not much of an abbreviation at all. It's two parameters are shape and scale. Let's take a look to see what sort of shapes we can get out. So when you have a shape parameter of one, this is actually just the exponential distribution. So I told you it was a generalization and there you go. That's just what an exponential distribution looks like. As we change the shape parameter to lower values, well, what we see is we get an extraordinarily uh, big skew here. So a lot of probability concentrated on tiny, tiny, tiny values and a non-negligible probability of getting very large values. Let's change the scale as well to see if we can flush out that structure. We're not doing so great. It has that shape kind of no matter what. Here we go. So once we go to... Um, shape parameters above one, well, we start getting that right-handed skew. So it's raising up to a peak and then slowly tapering off as we get to larger values. So actually the Weibull not only is a generalization of the exponential, but it's also a good second option if the log normal distribution isn't quite fitting your data. We go to larger values of that shape parameter. Now we can see that left-hand skew emerging. And so we can see a variety of shapes. And so here's a cool discovery with that Weibull distribution. Once we've chosen the shape parameter, notice that the scale parameter doesn't actually change that shape. It's only the shape parameter that changes the shape of the Weibull. You know, who knew? It's actually a, a well-named parameter. That scale is just uh, talking about how concentrated those values are around that peak. So notice for a large scale parameter, relatively large variation in values, 
for a small scale parameter with a relatively narrow uh, range of values here. So what do we use that Weibull distribution for in business analytics? Well, if that exponential distribution doesn't work, we'll do the Weibull. So anything that the exponential distribution is designed to measure, we could use the Weibull distribution as well. So waiting times, processing times, manufacturing times, delivery times. You know, people even use it to describe the size distribution of particles. If you're milling flour or some other process, splitting up something big into lots of little itty bitty chunks, the size distribution turns out to resemble a Weibull distribution people have found. Wind speed distribution, some things in science as well. So it's seen a lot of good application. I just like it because it can give you the left skew, it can give you the right skew, relatively symmetric. It's a pretty flexible shape there. So another backup to the exponential distribution, if it's not working, is the gamma distribution, which is a different type of generalization of the exponential. So it gives you everything the exponential can give you, and then actually even more. Now, I haven't seen this used very often in business analytics because it has a shape that looks very similar to the log normal, looks very similar to the Weibull, but it's one you're gonna to wanna to keep in your toolkit because if the Weibull and the log normal don't work, well, maybe the gamma distribution will. R knows about it by the abbreviation gamma, so you can get probabilities, percentiles, quantiles, and even random numbers uh, from it relatively easily. It always has a little bit of a right-handed skew. It only allows positive quantities. It's relatively difficult to work with mathematically, but we'll know about it as a backup, but that's about all we really want to say about it. Now, the last distribution in our notorious zoo is the beta distribution. And this is actually a really great distribution, and one that I turn to a lot when doing probabilistic modeling. So whenever we have a, val a random variable that's constrained to live within a lower bound and an upper bound, well, chances are we're going to find some flavor of a beta distribution that provides a pretty good model. And this is because the beta distribution provides us a really big variety of different shapes that it can produce. Now, the beta distribution at its core is really only defined for values of x between 0 and 1, if you do have a set of values that range, let's say between A and B, there's a relatively simple formula for what to do with the originally recorded values to convert them so that they actually range between zero and one. So as long as your values are inside of a particular range, you should be able to model this with the beta distribution, maybe after that very quick transformation. And so let's just see what that beta distribution can do for us. So we got two parameters, the alpha and the beta parameter. If I change the alpha parameter, we can see we got a strong, oops, right-handed skew here, raising up to a peak pretty quickly, then decaying off, but always between zero and one. Make this parameter smaller. Well, now it just decreases really quickly as we go to larger values. A big beta, well, here we have a left-handed skew. We can see that actually we get a huge variety of different shapes that emerge out of here. Right skews, left skews, weird shape functions, kind of stuff that's decaying really quickly, something that's roughly symmetric, something that's increasing, you got it. So if you do have a random quantity that is constrained to live within a range of values, the beta distribution is probably gonna be your go-to because it has such a wide variety of shapes that you'll probably be able to find something that provides a pretty decent model here. How does R know about it? Well, it has the abbreviation of just beta. And so you could look to see what that distribution is by curving the d beta function. You could answer probabilities with the p beta function. But once again, where we use it is for any quantity that is constrained to live within a range. So just thinking about the range zero to one, well, that's kind of the natural domain for modeling, say, fractions. So the fraction of glass that actually ends up being filled up when the waiter pours water into it. Somewhere between zero and one, the beta distribution, probably a good model for it. We can find a shape that does a good job. Let's say we're measuring the fraction of time that someone uses when completing a task. Somewhere between zero and one, we can probably find a beta distribution. If we look at the fraction of people's budget that they spend on food versus other quantities, somewhere between zero and one, we can probably find a beta distribution to fit that pretty well. 
So it can be really tightly clustered around a small range of values like 0.5 to 0.75 or so. It can be spread out over the entirety. The beta really just is that flexible. So something that we're more than happy to have in our toolkit.